Right. Welcome to Holistic Orchard Pest and Disease Management. Um, so we're just going to be talking about dealing with those <clears throat> insect pests, animal pests, diseases that can bother um, all of those things that might be in our orchard, our fruit and nut producing uh, crops. I am Dean Gunderson, and I'm the Director of Education here at Seed St. Louis, and I also run our Giving Growth Program, which is the name of our orchard program. So first, um, I always just like to define what is a pest. So a pest is technically any organism that damages, stunts, or kills a plant that you don't want that to happen to. Um, so that organism could be a bird, it could be a mammal, it could be an um, insect, a microorganism like a fungus, bacteria, or virus. It could be a people, you know, a person doing stuff or people doing stuff or um, the tools that they wield. I would say the by far the number one killer of trees um, in St. Louis of the ones that we plant are weed eaters and lawnmowers, like by a wide margin. They are much more dangerous than any pest or disease when it comes to killing fruit trees. And sometimes what we consider a pest doesn't actually hurt the plant, but just makes the fruit less desirable for us. So that's another thing where there, there are diseases or pests um, that people really worry about that actually don't make the fruit any less edible. It might just make it look um, a way that we don't like. And so we'll kind of mention those as well, kind of the ones that you don't really need to worry about. So first, um, there's this idea, this belief that fruit trees have a whole lot of pests and diseases, um, and that is partially true, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and most of those reasons are um, human-caused. Uh, it's, not, it's not that the plant is necessarily more pest or disease susceptible. So a big one is a lack of genetic diversity. So for the most part, when we are growing um, fruit in particular, there, oh, there are grafting, not grading. Um, so we are grafting those or just propagating them asexually in some way. So what that means is that, um, you know, if you do a cutting, so most grapes are propagated by cuttings, just as an example. So if you have a grape and you're like, oh, I really like this Concord grape. So all Concord grapes on the planet are genetically identical to each other. They are all clones of each other because the way that they're propagated is you take a branch from a Concord grape, you stick it in the ground, it grows roots, you have a new Concord grape. So if you have you know, a vineyard that's a whole bunch of Concord grapes, from a genetic standpoint, all that it's just one giant plant. And so if there's a pest or disease that Concord grape is susceptible to, the entire vineyard is susceptible to it. And the same thing happens with apples, pears, peaches, plums, cherries, Blackberries, raspberries, these are all propagated asexually. They are all clones of each other. So a red delicious apple, every red delicious apple on planet Earth is a clone of every other red delicious apple. So, you know, if you have a row like this and a disease hits this first red delicious apple, it's probably going to go all the way down the row because they're, they're essentially the exact same plant. Or if a pest comes along and that pest really likes to eat red delicious apples. And a, a good example of this is Liberty apple. So Liberty apple is an apple that for some reason, Japanese beetles really, really like. If there's other apples around, they're gonna go for the Liberty apple. Don't know why, but they but they really like Liberty apple. And so if you have this big row of all Liberty apples and Japanese beetles show up and start munching on this one, as soon as they get done eating all of this, they're just gonna keep moving down the line and eating them all because they're all the same. <clears throat> but beyond that, almost all of the fruit we regrow, regrow, even if we were growing seedlings of them, are actually not all that different from each other. Virtually all the fruit that we grow is in the Rosaceae family. They're all in the exact same family. Um, and we'll talk about kind of which ones are in that family, but they're all really closely related. And then of course, monocultures. So again, even if we were growing seedlings, which is you know better from a disease management standpoint or from a genetic diversity standpoint, um, if we're all growing just apples or just pears or just peaches, and we're growing a lot of them, again, it's going to be much easier for a pest or disease to come in and just move through the whole space. Also, a lot of the, the varieties that people know were not bred here. They were not bred for the Midwestern climate. In particular, they were not bred for our heat and humidity in the summer. They tend to have been bred in New England or Michigan or the Pacific Northwest, somewhere that have much more mild summers than we have. Um, and so they just tend to have more disease because they're they're just not adapted to our climate. 
And they are also, many of them are not bred for ease of care. A lot of breeding programs in the last 70, 80 years um, or more, the breeding has been done while the seedlings are being sprayed um, with pesticides and fungicides and things like that. And they were selecting for, well, which ones can survive when you're spraying them all the time and produce a desirable apple for shipping or market or taste or whatever. And so you don't really know how disease resistant they are because they're being managed for those diseases through chemical sprays from day one. And so if you're not going to do those sprays, then they might, then they're gonna look like they have a lot of disease. They also just are very vigorous species. Fruit trees, um, almost all of them grow very fast. Um, and just when things grow very fast, they're more susceptible to some diseases like fire blight or aphids or you know a couple different things. And our climate is just a rough one. It gets really cold in the winter or we can have these spells where you know it drops below zero. And then in the summer it can be below or above a hundred with you know, 60, 70% humidity. Um, so you know, very extreme. Uh, weather makes these plants more stressed. And also just the fact that fruit is really good. And so, you know, we like it, but so do bugs and so do animals and so do insects and, you know, all, all these different things also like to eat the fruit just like we do. And for the same reasons. So to create a, a healthy orchard, um, and this is, you know, a primary way of, um, of controlling pests and disease, you want to make sure you have the right plant. This is huge, huge, and we're going to talk about this. Um, starting with the right plant is huge to the point where if you planted one that maybe wasn't a good idea, it might be worth it to cut it down and get a new one. Uh, that's how important having the right plant can be if you're looking to manage pests and diseases without, um, without a lot of chemical intervention. Also, planning for diversity can be helpful, which we're going to talk about. Um, and then managing your plants, all the stuff that people say to do to your plants. One of the reasons that you do them is because it controls pests and diseases. So things like pruning, sanitation, uh, which is like cleaning up leaves and branches and dropped fruit and stuff like that, watering them, mulching them, weeding them, all these things help. And then helping your allies. Um, so, you know, there's beneficial birds, there's beneficial insects, there's beneficial microorganisms, and there's ways to help those things along so that they can help knock out the pests for you. And then at the end, we're going to talk about um, some of the most common pests and diseases um, that you will see in the St. Louis area and how to manage those in a holistic way if, you know, they do show up and are a problem for you. So first, just having the right plant. Um, plants that aren't stressed, plants that aren't struggling to survive because the conditions aren't right for it, are going to be much less likely to get a disease and also less likely to get attacked by insects, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> and this is, this, this is, is hugely important. I mean, it's, uh, again, may, just making sure that your plant is in the right location. Um, and so like the, the stress, like I mentioned, can, in, can increase um, insect feeding, particularly of sucking insects, so things like aphids, if you have a really stressful condition. Um, and we actually saw this on a lot of trees this spring when we had that late frost and it, um, and it zapped some of the leaves, we then saw huge numbers of aphids show up on those same trees because those trees were stressed by that late frost and the aphids just swooped right in and started sucking out the juices, which is what they do. You get that freeze, it damages the tissues. The, the sap then has more nutrients for aphids and white flies and sucking insects. Um, and so they come in and become a problem. So what you want to do is you want to select a locally adapted crop. So what this means is a, is a plant that like is, is pretty solid here. So not something that is like right on the edge necessarily. So things like, um, you know, honeyberries do okay here, um, but really we're kind of too hot for them. And so they are more stressed. Um, they're going to be more susceptible to issues. Um, things that really want to grow further south, and so like our winters are really harsh, they're going to be more stressed. Um, but so selecting those things that are, um, that have been grown here a long time, that are locally adapted is going to be really useful. And then selecting naturally disease-resistant varieties is huge, um, which I think I'm going to talk about. Or... Um, but picking ones that are naturally disease resistant, we have resources on this that I'll send out to everyone in terms of what varieties um, we recommend, which ones seem to do well and are particularly disease resistant. This can be really, really helpful. 
Um, and then just selecting crops that are less prone to insect pests. So some things just have more insect pests. Things like plums get an insect that's really, really, really hard to control organically. Um, uh, peaches get a lot more pests than apples do, and apples get a lot more pests than pawpaws do. You know, so like just picking ones that have fewer insects can be really helpful, and then select the right spot for the crop. So you want to you know look at look at your plant, um, you know, and read up on it a little bit, kind of figure out you know where does this want to be. Um, so just as some some general rules, most fruit trees, I mean really all fruit trees, um, none of them like to be in wet soil. If you've got like a really soggy, wet spot, find something else to grow. Uh, fruit trees really don't like that. There's a few that can like tolerate that, like pawpaws or persimmons or elderberries, but they still don't really love it. Um, pretty much all fruit trees like a soil that is gonna be pretty free draining. Um, so just not in a really wet spot. Um, something, and, and there's varying degrees of tolerance to that. So things like cherries are kind of the most um, picky about that. So if you've got a spot that isn't pretty good drainage, um, you probably just don't want to plant a cherry. It's just, it's just not gonna, it's, it's gonna be more difficult for you. Um, and also, you know, if you want to grow blueberries, I honestly am not, it, it's, it's almost, it's almost irresponsible for nurseries in St. Louis to sell blueberries because they don't want to grow here. Um, you need very specific soils to grow blueberries well, and that's not the soil that St. Louis has. They want a really light, fluffy, highly acidic soil. St. Louis has heavy clay alkaline soil. Um, blueberries do not want to grow here. And so, you know, just looking that up, kind of looking what kind of soil, what kind of conditions do these plants want, and then um, find that spot in your yard, your garden, your orchard, wherever you're working. Um, and if you don't have that spot, I would probably recommend picking another plant or you're gonna need to change your conditions. You're gonna need to do something to change your soil to make it what that plant wants if you're really committed to doing that plant. But it's much harder to change your soils after you plant your trees than it is to do it before. And then planting it appropriately. So, you know, making sure you're digging, you know, a good hole that the roots are have enough room to to spread out. Um, I don't recommend amending the hole. You know, just um, backfilling with the soil you have, uh, watering your tree when you when you plant, um, adding a nice carbon rich mulch on the top. So that would be things like wood chips. I mean, really, wood chips are the best. Um, but you could use straw or fallen leaves or um, you know or something else. But, um, but wood chips are really kind of the best and easiest thing to use as a mulch. And then also um, planning for diversity. So in biology and in all things, most likely, um, diversity is the key to strength. Uh, and, there's, and there's four types of diversity to consider when we're talking about uh, fruit trees. So there's varietal diversity. So this is thinking about, you know, how. Of, of not just having one variety of apple or two varieties of apples. But you know, if you're gonna plant four apples, it, it is probably better to have four different apple varieties. So, you know, instead of having, you know, two enterprise and two red free, have an enterprise, a red free, a pristine and an Arkansas black, you know, have four different ones. So have that varietal diversity. Um, also species diversity. So, you know, if you're gonna plant four fruit trees, instead of doing four apples, maybe do two apples and two pears or two apples and two pawpaws or something else. So having that species diversity can also help because there's certain insects and pests that are most insects and pests um, are not gonna impact multiple species. They, they tend to go after one species in particular. Um, <clears throat> but then also, uh, familial diversity can be helpful. So as I mentioned, uh, rosaceae family, almost all of our fruit are in the rosaceae family. And a lot of times uh, what is very similar is, is the flower structure. So the flat, when the flowers look similar, usually they're related. So I would say, you know, if you look at, at these five flowers here, you know, if you look at this, these first four look 
pretty similar. And this last one looks pretty different. So I would say that these first four are, they, they are all Rosaceae family. They are all pretty closely related to each other. And just to show you, you know, that it can look like you have a lot of diversity and really not have a huge amount of diversity. So this one is a peach. This one is an almond. This one is a blackberry. This one is a strawberry. They're all rosaceae. They're all closely related to each other. Um, even though if you if you were telling people, oh, I'm growing almonds and uh, peaches and blackberries and strawberries, you'd think, wow, you've got so much diversity in there. But you really don't um, in in some ways, you know, in that familial level. So breaking outside of that rosaceae family. And again, you can look this up. If you're looking at a plant, you can see what family it is. Um, just like if you Google it, usually it'll it'll tell you what family it's in. This last one here is pawpaw. Pawpaw is not in the rosaceae family, and there are really no pests or diseases that impact it. For the most part, the stuff that is not in the rosaceae family has very, very few pests and diseases in the St. Louis area, like very few, if any. <clears throat> and so, you know, breaking out of that rosaceae family can also be a way to reduce pest and disease management on your part because you have fewer trees that are going to have a lot of pest and disease issues. And then also geographical diversity. So this just means, um, you know, kind of mixing your plants around. So, you know, if you're going to plant 10 apple trees and, you know, I don't know, 10 peaches or something like that, instead of doing 10 apple trees all in a row and then 10 peach trees all in a row, maybe do apple peach, apple peach, apple peach. Um, because although that may not seem like a lot of distance between them, if you're a little tiny aphid or a little tiny bug um, moving from one apple tree all the way across a peach tree that maybe you're not going to eat, to get to the apple that you do want to eat, that's a long journey. And along that journey, you could you could dehydrate, you could get eaten by a ladybug, you could get eaten by a bird, um, you could just get distracted and fall <laughs> in the grass or something. Versus if there's two apple trees right next to each other and they're touching each other, it's very easy for those pests to just climb right on over and infect your next tree. And maximizing diversity in all four of these categories can really increase the resilience of your of your broader orchard. So some other ways to add diversity um, to, to get those, you know, familial, um, that familial diversity in particular can be things like edible landscaping or doing, um, using principles of food forests or things like that, where maybe your fruit trees are all in the rosaceae family, but you can be adding other families in um, through ornamentals or natives or herbs or other things that you're planting kind of around your trees or in between your trees. <clears throat> you know, maybe you want an ornamental flowering bush and you stick that between your two apple trees so that again, your apple trees have a little bit of geographical distance between them, um, but you're still using that space for something that you like. So mixing your orchard crops with vegetables, herbs, perennial vegetables, pollinator plants and ornamentals is a great way to very quickly increase uh, really all four forms of diversity. And layering plantings increases diversity and is a way to do that while still using kind of all of your footprint for growing fruit. So layering just means like growing things underneath. So this is an apple tree and we've got some garlic chives and some edible mushrooms that we planted in the mulch ring around the tree. I've also seen places where they're growing, you know, horseradish or um, chives or sea kale, which is a perennial vegetable. Um, there's lots of different things that you can plant or even other fruiting bushes. Um, underneath a tree is actually one of the best places in St. Louis to plant a honeyberry um, because they're shaded, which keeps them a little cooler. And so honeyberries, which are a, a type of honeysuckle that produces a really good berry that's like ripe right now, um, is, is a great way to add diversity in your orchard um, and also allowing you to grow that plant that you couldn't grow in full sun if they're just not happy in full sun. Um, also, strawberries do great in the mulch ring around your tree. And then managing your plants is really important. So training or pruning your plants, and we have a, you know, a whole, we have two whole classes on this. Um, so I'm not going to go into the specifics of how to prune your plants, but why it's important for managing pests and disease um, is when you're training and you're pruning your plants, one of the primary things we're doing is we're training and pruning them so that 
as many branches and leaves as possible are getting direct sunlight on them and are getting maximum airflow around them. And what this does is it's helping lower humidity and the ultraviolet radiation from the sun is helping to kill off um, especially fungal spores and other things like that. So that airflow and that sun is a really good disinfectant. It helps um, make it harder for especially fungal diseases to get established. It also makes life harder for insect pests that are gonna come along and try and sit on your leaves and eat your tree. If they're having to do that in the blaring summer sun, they're gonna be less likely to wanna eat that leaf if they can go over to some shady area um, and get food over there. And trellising for things like your grapes, your hardy kiwis, your blackberries, and your raspberries um, also helps in the same way to maximize airflow and sun by holding them upright so that they're not sprawling on the ground or tangled up in each other, um, reducing airflow. Sanitation is also important. So what this means is that when you are pruning your trees, your shrubs, your vines, um, all cutting surfaces, so all the, the blades of the pruners or the saws or the loppers, whatever it is you're using, um, should be sanitized with either like a rubbing alcohol, iodine, um, a diluted bleach solution, something that is a good like sanitizing agent. Um, anytime you are moving from one plant to the next. So if you're pruning an apple tree, when you're done with that, before you start on the next apple tree, you want to wipe down those, those pruners. And that's because if there was a disease in that first tree that maybe you did or didn't know about, um, you don't want it on your pruners and then um, infecting the next tree that you're, that you're cutting. So that can be really um, a really important way to reduce spreading some diseases, especially things like fire blight, which um, can spread really easily through contaminated pruners. Uh, the prunings that you, that you make, the branches that you cut off, the vines that you cut off, whatever it is that you're cutting, um, you shouldn't just leave laying in a heap in your orchard or just on the ground around your tree because those prunings could have insect pest eggs on them. They could have mold spores on them. They could have fire blight bacteria on them. They could have these pests and diseases on them. And so when you cut them, you wanna clean those up and you wanna remove them from the space, whether that's just geographically as far away as you can get them or in a yard waste dumpster or burning them in a bonfire or something, um, but you want them away from your trees. Any fruit that uh, falls from the trees, so you can see in this picture, um, you know, these apples that are laying on the ground, you don't wanna just leave those there rotting. Because oftentimes if a tree is dropping a fruit early, the reason it's doing that is because that fruit has a bug in it. And so if it, if it drops to the ground and there's a little worm in there and it can just munch and munch and munch sitting on the ground because you left it laying there, it's eventually gonna get its fill, it's gonna come out of the apple, it's gonna dig into the ground, it's gonna pupate, it's gonna turn into a new moth and it's gonna fly up and infect more apples. Um, and this can happen in just like a week or two, like it can, it can happen pretty quickly. And so you want to be picking up any fruit that's dropping on the ground. Um, and then especially in the fall, um, any leaves, like the leaves that have fallen off your plants, you want to either mulch those up with your lawnmower, or you want to rake those up and remove them. Um, because those leaves can also have disease spores, um, you know, fire blight bacteria, it can have uh, cocoons of these insects that are eating your fruit. And so you want to chop those up uh, and or remove them from your orchard to kind of break that disease cycle. You also just want to uh, manage your plants in a way that is going to make them uh, grow better, be healthier. So this can be things like watering them. <laughs> if, it's, uh, if it's your first year of planting them, you should be watering them at least once a week. Um, every week for that first year, and then as needed afterwards. So if we're in a really stressful condition, even if your tree is older, and that would be, you know, if it's like in the 90s and hasn't rained in a couple of weeks, watering your tree is gonna, is gonna make it less stressed. It's gonna make it less susceptible to pests and diseases. So watering your trees as needed, mulching them. So this would again be things like wood chips in particular. Mulching helps to conserve moisture which is gonna make them less stressed. They're gonna have the water that they need. It helps suppress grass, which can, um, which helps trees in a lot of different ways. Uh, and it actually increases the fungal populations in your soil. 
which is actually beneficial for your trees. Your trees want fungus in the soil um, and wood chips help with that. <clears throat> and then just suppressing grass. Grass, just in, grass especially like turf grass and especially if it's Bermuda grass is really stressful on a tree. It can really reduce the growth rate of the tree. Um, because grass wants a bacterially dominated soil. It doesn't really want fungus in the soil. The tree wants fungus in the soil. It doesn't really need bacteria in the soil. And so if the grass is there, it is pumping sugars into the soil to keep the bacteria populations high and the fungal populations low, which is the opposite of what your trees want. So you wanna remove that grass away from the tree so that the tree can be putting out its own sugars um, to increase the fungal population that is gonna help that tree to grow, get the nutrients that it needs out of the soil and be a help, happy, healthy tree. <clears throat> so there's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, you can, you know, weed it if you need to do that. Weed it, or you know, with a hoe or something like that. Um, mulch does help. You can also plant tall, clumping, or running perennials. So things that are not grass, things that are leafy, um, can help boost the the fungal population a little bit and outcompete the grass. So this would be things like comfrey or daylily. Horseradish, um, mint uh, are all great things for around your tree that will help outcompete and push the grass away from the trunk of the tree. It can also be helpful to support your large allies. So this would be things like, you know, owls and other large birds of prey eat a lot of rodents. Rodents are another big problem for fruit trees, especially in the winter. Um, they can, they'll gnaw on the bark, they can girdle trees, they can kill them. So voles are, um, uh, are particularly a problem, or they're the ones that do it a lot, but also rabbits will do this, mice will do this. Um, any rodent can and will chew on fruit tree bark, especially in the middle of winter when there's not a lot of other food, uh, because fruit tree bark it has some of the highest sugar content of any tree species. Um, those fruiting trees have a lot of sugar in their bark. And so in the middle of winter, when they need food, those sweet barks are the ones that they're going to want. Um, and so doing things like putting up barn owl boxes, which I just learned was a thing a couple of years ago, but there are like birdhouses for barn owls. Um, each barn owl, like, on, like when they've studied them, eats 155 rodents a year. And so, you know, if you've got a barn owl box up, and they start a little barn owl family. I mean, they could be eating hundreds of rodents in your in your neighborhood. And so you're gonna have probably not as many vole problems in your orchard. You can put up perches for things like hawks. They, you know, they make, there's different structures that you can find to put up perches to try and um, attract hawks and falcons um, and things like that to come around to uh, to scare, but also to eat rodents and other animals that can be a problem in your orchard. Songbirds are also really beneficial, actually. The primary food of most songbirds is uh, caterpillars, primarily moth caterpillars. Um, and moth caterpillars are the number one pests of fruit trees. And so having songbirds around can be really helpful at reducing your pest pressure in your orchard. <clears throat> there was one study that found that bluebird, the bluebird population in a vineyard increased 10 times just by putting bluebird boxes out. Um, and then those birds were eating caterpillars. Um, so even if they weren't eating a huge number, increasing the population by 10 times, you're gonna see an, a decrease in those caterpillar populations. Um, another really, really, really important way to benefit songbirds is to keep your cats inside. Um, the only species on the planet that has caused more extinctions than cats are us, um, is human beings. Cats have wiped out a lot of bird species around the world um, because they just like to kill for fun. Um, they're kind of in the same category as us in that we're kind of some of the only species that will just kill for fun. Um, and so they, they have caused lots of radical decreases in songbird populations. And so especially if you're trying to attract songbirds to your area, don't then let your cat outside because they're they might be eating the birds. <clears throat> uh, bats can also be beneficial. Um, bats eat a lot of night flying moths and a lot of those moths that lay the caterpillars that cause the problems in our orchards are night flying moths. So having bat boxes or looking up other ways to support bat populations can also be helpful. And um, this seems a little, a little 
a uh, bit of a roundabout way to do it. But another beneficial thing you can do is actually planting oaks, willows, poplars, and prunus, like native uh, oak, willows, poplars, and prunus, because these support the most species of caterpillars. Um, so, and so because of that, they have kind of the most caterpillars on them. And so you're gonna be providing a year round food source for uh, those songbirds so that they are around, so that they can be eating your insect caterpillar pests um, when, uh, when they show up in your orchard. So having those native trees around also helps to kind of build that ecosystem that's gonna support you. And then having a water source, um, you know, birds, beneficial insects, um, all those things, they need, they need water. And, you know, generally speaking in our environments, we don't like to have lots of stagnant standing water around because we don't like mosquitoes, which of course makes sense. But especially if we're in a drought, if that means that the birds need to fly, you know, two miles that way to a lake to get water, they're probably not going to stay in your orchard. They're probably going to go over and hang out by that water um, where they need it. Versus if you have an area maybe with a little fountain, so it's moving, or you can, there's like little things that you can put in the water that um, will prevent mosquitoes from, um, from growing in the water. Um, so having that water around so that there is water available for um, your beneficial um, birds and bats and other things can be another great way to support them. Um, so that they can support you. And then support your small allies. So your insects. Uh, there are, you know, lots of important insects that can help you a lot. Pollinators being the one that get kind of the most attention. Um, so that would be things like bees, butterflies, um, even birds, although not really in our fruit trees, but um, wasps can also be pollinators. There's lots of different pollinating um, things. And even in bees, there's literally hundreds of species of bees in the St. Louis area. So there are lots of different things that can be beneficial for pollinators. But there's also things that fit into the category of predatory insects um, and parasitic insects. So these are insects that can potentially eat the pest insects or will parasitize the pest insects. So um, an example of this is a parasitic wasp. And this is like nightmare fuel. Um, but this is one right here. And what they do is the female, uh, there, there's a couple different ways that this can happen. But one of the ways is like that this female uh, has a specific caterpillar that it likes, and it will fly around until it finds that. And when it finds it, it will land on it, and it will sting it, and it will inject it with a paralyzing agent so that that caterpillar can't move. And then it will lay its eggs inside of it. And then it will fly away. And then that caterpillar, eventually the paralyzing agent will wear off. It'll go about its life for a couple days. Uh, and eventually those eggs inside it will hatch out alien style and eat the caterpillar. Um, and so that, you know, kills that caterpillar for you, which is nice. Um, but it also then creates several more parasitic wasps that are going to go fly and do the exact same thing. And they can be really helpful for knocking back pest populations. And they tend to be relatively specific. Like they're not going to come and do that to you or anything. Like they're come, they're doing it to specific insect families or even specific species of insect that they will parasitize on. And then there's predatory insects. So those are things like praying mantis or ladybugs or um, there, there's lots of different ones that can eat these predatory insects just outright, just eat them for you. And so the ways that you can promote these small, these insects uh, that are beneficial to you, either through pollinating or eating pests, is by creating habitat to feed, shelter, and provide overwintering and egg laying sites for them. Um, <clears throat> kind of the main way to do that is in your, your vicinity, you want to aim, you want to have plants that you're planting with the goal of having as much of a continuous bloom, as in like something blooming all the time for as many months out of the year as possible, and ideally of native plants, and even more ideally of native plants that have little flowers. So the reason that the little flowers is helpful is because a lot of these parasitic and predatory insects, their primary food source is eating insects. And so their mouth parts are not designed to get into these big complicated flowers. So the pollen and the nectar and stuff is just to like when there aren't insects to eat, they go after these. And so you want them there so that they have food even when you don't have pests, because hopefully you don't have pests every single day. But you want them there so that when the pest does show up, they can go and eat it. 
but their mouth parts is easier for them to get into little flowers. So having little flowers is better for the predatory and parasitic insects. Pollinators tend to be able to get into really kind of any flower. Um, but having those smaller flowers is good for the other beneficial insects. Native is important because most of these predatory, parasitic, and pollinator insects, like, like all of them, um, are native. And so they have adapted to feeding on the native plants. And so those are going to be more valuable to them than non-native plants. And this is just a list here of um, kind of a, a short list of ones that we like to kind of add into the orchard um, that can provide those, those flowers with a pretty long um, bloom time. And then supporting what I call your micro allies. So there are beneficial um, bacteria and fungi and nematodes and microarthropods. Like there's beneficial um, things that you can't see with the naked eye. So one of the primary ways that we do that we support these um, in our uh, giving growth program, and if you're you know one of our orchards, um, then you get what's called the holistic spray. So this is a um, a spray schedule that is described in this book, the Holistic Orchard, um, that was written by a man named Michael Phillips. And what it is is it's really kind of core four main ingredients, and then some soap to help it um, kind of mix in with the water and stick to um, the plant when you spray it on. There's like a whole schedule. It's a whole thing. It could be like a whole class just on this spray thing. But if you're one of our orchards, um, you'll get specific um, cards on that. I get you the sprays, all of that. Um, but the four things are effect effective microbes, liquid fish, um, a, a kind of a, a less processed form of neem oil that's like really thick. It's almost like coconut oil kind of consistency, um, whey or milk, and then soap. Um, and these just help to um, inoculate your plant with um, effective microbes, so beneficial microbes. Um, and then these other things are mostly to help feed those beneficial microbes so that they colonize the surface of the plant in the spring so that it's harder for a, um, a pathogen to come along and infect the tree. But if you wanna like dive into that more um, deeply, if you're interested in that specifically, um, I really highly recommend this book. It's it's a really great book um, that goes through kind of most of the stuff we're talking about today, um, as well as some other general stuff. But it's just a it's a good it's a good manual. <clears throat> um, and then yeah, just some some quick rundowns on this. Actually, let me see. Uh, yeah. So I'll run through these real quick. Um, so there are kind of four, what we do is we kind of do four main sprays and then a fall spray. Um, so they happen at kind of these four times. So the first time is like when the leaves are just starting to leaf out. The second time is down here. Um, when the flowers are just about to open, we do a second spray. We do the third spray after all the petals have fallen off the tree um, of the flower. And then we do the fourth spray just 10 to 14 days after um, we do the third spray, whenever that is. And then we do the fall spray after all the leaves have fallen off the tree um, in the fall. Yeah. Um, if you are not doing the holistic spray um, or just when your trees are young, so generally you don't want your, you don't want to allow your trees to produce fruit for the, at least the first three years. Um, if, um, so before your tree produces fruit, you really don't need to be doing the holistic sprays. Um, there's not a whole lot of benefit to them because the fruit is really when you start getting lots of pests and diseases. Um, the main disease, the main insect pests that you're gonna get on trees that are not producing fruit can mostly be controlled by a horticultural oil. Um, so these are also called dormant oils. Um, so you can use that before the leaves or flowers have opened up. Um, whey or milk can also be useful for um, uh, if you have any any fungal diseases that show up, and then um, fish and coconut milk can be a good foliar fertilizer if you're wanting to to fertilize your trees. So, <clears throat> assuming you do those things, or maybe or or you don't, but um, either way, if you get something that you think is a pest or disease, it's important to know what you're dealing with, especially if you're wanting to control it in an organic or more holistic way. Because most organic treatments, we don't wanna just be like nuking the tree. Like we don't wanna just be like, let's spray something that'll kill everything. Um, 
And so assuming you don't want to do that, you need to know what it is you're wanting to kill <laughs> or control. Because uh, just as an example, if you've got a beetle problem and you spray BT on it, it, it will literally do absolutely nothing. Um, but if you have uh, a coddling moth on your tree and you spray it with BT, it'll kill all those coddling moths in like a couple days. And so you really want to know what you're dealing with. Um, and that can be kind of hard sometimes. So that's um, that's where it kind of comes to, you're wanting to actually look at the tree. What is the damage that you're seeing? Are you seeing insects doing the damage? If so, can you get a picture? Can you send that picture to someone who knows or look around on the internet? There's lots of great resources on the internet about this stuff. And it's also important to know that not all damage is a pest or disease. Sometimes uh, your fruit might look weird and it might be because the plant was not pollinated properly. Um, some fruit is really lumpy if it doesn't get pollinated fully. Um, it's not a disease, it's not a, a pest, it didn't get pollinated. So it doesn't matter what you do to the tree, it's not gonna make it not lumpy because it like the fruit, the pollination has passed. Um, weed eaters cause a lot of problems. Uh, if you see stuff like this on your leaves, you might be like, oh my gosh, there's a big pest. Well, that is a leaf cutter bee. So, I mean, you could deal with that, but it would require you spraying and killing a bunch of bees. Um, and they're not actually gonna cause a lot of damage to your plant. So you wanna just kind of know what you're dealing with. And a lot of times, especially if you don't know right away, it could be because there's multiple issues happening at the same time. Because again, generally these pests and these diseases are coming after stressed plants. And so it's not just like, oh my gosh, this disease magically showed up and it's impacting this tree because it because it showed up. These diseases are around pretty much all the time. The, the fact that it's infecting a tree is usually a sign of a stressed tree um, in one shape or another. And so, you know, if it's stressed enough that it's getting hit by one thing, probably also stressed enough to get hit by multiple things. And so sometimes you're going to be looking and you're going to be potentially finding multiple things that are going wrong. And so, um, and so, yeah, you just want to be looking, you want to kind of know. And once you start doing this and you start noticing kind of, oh, this is what this looks like. You're Googling around, you're seeing, oh, this is what it is. Um, it gets much easier to diagnose these things over time. Um, but you want to know what it is first, because that's what's going to decide what the treatment is. So as an example here, so one of the first disease of note, and this is one of the only diseases that will outright kill your tree if you don't treat it, is called fire blight. So just some basic ecology, fire blight will attack apples, pears, service berries, and Japanese plum. It is a bacterial disease. It overwinters on bark cankers. So that's things like this, these kind of sunken black parts of bark. It can kill your plant. It generally shows up first with the blossoms turning black um, and then kind of working its way down into the branch, or it can start at the tip of a very vigorously growing branch and then work its way down. The twigs and leaves will shrivel and look charred. Like this is what it looks like. Kind of looks like somebody kind of burnt your, your tree or right here, you know, kind of looks black um, like somebody burnt it. Um, and, that's, and that's how you know you got fire blight. Uh, it is absolutely everywhere because calorie pears carry it, but often don't show symptoms. Um, so all those wonderful Bradford pears that the generations before us planted basically mean that we always have fire blight all the time. Um, and so it's always around. It's just about seeing if your tree gets infected and then treating it. The only treatment for it, once the infection happens, you know, if you see a damaged branch, there is no spray, there is no magic to to get rid of it other than removal of infected tissue. So cutting off the infected branch is the only way to get rid of fire blight in a plant. You wanna cut out the infected area back um, at least six inches, but about six to 12 inches back from where it looks like it's done because it moves from the inside out. And so like here where you're like, oh, this leaf is brown, but this one down here is green. You're gonna be cutting into that green tissue um, because you could have an area up here that still looks alive, but when you cut it and you look at the the, the stick, it's gonna be it's gonna be brown. So wherever you cut it, just look at the stump of what you cut. And if you see that nice green, healthy ring on there, you got the fire blight out. If you cut it and there is no green, then you need to cut back further to get all the fire blight out. 
There are um, some biocontrols that you can use to help prevent fire blight. So if fire blight is something that you have year after year and is a big problem for you, there is a product called Monterey Complete Disease Control that you can spray on the tree in the spring and it reduces the infection rate. Um, so it's gonna help reduce how often you get fire blight. Um, it's actually, it's just a bacteria. So it's not, it's not toxic, um, it's non-pathogenic to people or um, the trees. It's just a really aggressive bacteria that helps outcompete um, any fire blight that's kind of blowing in on the wind. Brown rot is another common disease um, that can affect your stone fruits. So those are things like cherries, peaches, apricots, um, nectarines, plums potentially. This is a fungal disease. <clears throat> the infected blooms um, then form cankers that later infect fruit. So the, the fruit will start looking like this, like real nasty, and it turns into kind of these brown mummies that hang on the tree. Um, and it overwinters in those mummies. That's where it overwinters. So if you have, whoop, so if you have like hanging fruit on your peach and you're like, oh, my peaches were bad. So I just didn't pick them, pick them and get rid of them. Um, because if you leave those hanging there, that spore is then there. So that next spring, when they leaf out, it's just going to reinfect the tree and you're going to have brown rot again. So the best controls for this are pruning and thinning your fruit to maximize sun and air because it is a fungal disease. So having maximum air and sun, um, sun and, and airflow in your tree is going to reduce those fungal infections. Um, removing and destroying or throwing away or something, those kind of shriveled up fruit. <clears throat> you can also use copper, like a liquid copper product um, at bud break. So like kind of right before they, they leaf out, which will help kill off any um, brown rot that overwintered. So if you had brown rot last year, doing that can help reduce the infection this year. Um, and then sulfur can also be used after the leaves are open. That's another way to kind of kill off um, any brown rot that might be on your tree. Whey, like the milk product, um, is actually a pretty effective preventative. If you see brown rot and spray whey on it, it's not gonna do anything. But it's a good way of like, oh, I had brown rot in the past. And if you start spraying whey every couple of weeks, um, starting when the, the leaves open up, um, it'll help reduce the infection rate of brown rot. And then again, Monterey Complete Disease Control is a good preventative as well. Peach leaf curl is incredibly common in St. Louis. Um, this overwinters on leaves and branches. It infects the leaf buds. So it, in, it is the infection has happened before the leaves even open. So when you see infected leaves like this, it's too late. There's nothing you can do this year. So picking off these leaves individually, not really going to do anything. Um, and the infection often doesn't show up until May. So um, this does not kill the tree, but regular consistent infection does weaken and stress the tree and makes it more likely that it is going to die from some other cause. The best control for this is sanitation, cleaning up leaves that fall off the tree in the fall, removing them from the orchard, cleaning up your prunings, um, pruning your trees, all those different things, and then copper. Um, so this is especially if you've had a history of peach leaf curl, the best um, control is in the fall after all the leaves have fallen and after you have cleaned up and removed all of those leaves, then spray all of the trunk and branches with a copper spray, which will help kill off any spores that are still hanging around on the bark. And then do a copper spray again in the spring right before they leaf out again to just hit if there happens to be any that overwintered. Um, and doing that is gonna drastically reduce again your, your infection rate. But again, I just like to point out, because I know a lot of people that are like, this leaf's infected, I need to remove this leaf. You can do that, it's not gonna hurt, but there's been studies that have shown that that doesn't really help a whole lot um, because the infection happens when the leaves are still in their bud form. So before they're actually fully open. So removing it at this point, like all the leaves are already infected that are gonna get infected basically. They just haven't necessarily shown the, the, the warping yet. This is one that I like to talk about mostly because it is not actually a problem um, for, for eating the fruit. So this, so sooty blotch and fly speck 
are anywhere between 40 and 80 different fungal species that can cause these two diseases. And this is all it is. It's when you get these kind of sooty, blotchy kind of patches on your apples. They don't look pleasant. They wouldn't be good to sell in a grocery store, but it is purely a surface infection. It doesn't damage the fruit itself at all. It doesn't hurt the tree at all. And those fungus are not poisonous to you at all. And so it's perfectly safe and fine to eat an apple that looks like this. It's not going to hurt you. Um, and so in terms of control, it's not really needed. Um, but if you really want to try and control that, you don't like the look of it, whey can be effective, again, as a preventative. Um, so spraying that in the spring every couple of weeks until harvest can help prevent that. Um, or you can just wash it off. You can, If you kind of scrub the apple, almost all of that will come off. Because again, it's just a surface um, growth. In terms of pests, um, one of the, the biggest uh, or most, most common and most destructive pests um, is the coddling moth. So coddling moth will attack apples and pears um, in really, really bad cases. So at like the Science Center had a huge infestation last year of them, and they attacked every fruit tree they had, including jujubes, which I've never seen any insect attack. So coddling moth can attack just about anything, but generally they're just going to go after apples and pears, and really apples is what they really like. There are two generations per year. Adults overwinter in leaf litter and in bark crevices on your tree, and they lay eggs at the base of the little baby fruits right after they are, um, right after they're forming. In terms of control, sanitation is helpful. Banding, which is where you put um, like a piece of cardboard, literally just tape it around the trunk of the tree and then check it. And when you start seeing lots of little cocoons in it, remove that and burn it. <laughs> and then you are killing the cocoons. You're kind of breaking that disease cycle. Um, putting individual bags around the fruit can be helpful. Um, light tilling or letting your chickens kind of forage underneath um, your fruit trees can be helpful because most of these will overwinter in the soil or the leaf litter on the ground. And so if you allow chickens or attract wild bird by scattering some bird seed or something to scratch around and eat those, uh, that's going to be helpful. In terms of spray, Bt and spinosad are two organic options. There's also an, an organism called coddling moth granulovirus, which is a, a virus that um, kills coddling moth that you can buy in like a powdered form online. It's relatively expensive, but I hear it's pretty effective. Another pest that is very similar is the oriental fruit moth. However, their favorite is peaches. Um, by far, they love peaches, uh, but they will also go after apples, pears, cher and cherries. They overwinter in the ground or on the bark, just like coddling moth. They lay their eggs on new shoots of peaches. You'll see this a lot, where if the tip of your peach branch kind of looks like this, where it's mangled or kind of drooped and looking dead and sad, that's not a disease. That is uh, these worms eating literally the, the branch. And they do that because they wake up before the fruit starts forming. So that second generation then will start eating the fruit. And they can have, I believe it's up to four generations per season. Uh, controls for this are very similar in terms of sanitation, um, pruning out these. Um, so especially like if you if you catch them early, you can you know prune out and get that that little maggot out of there. Um, the same thing with light tilling chickens, creating habitat for beneficial insects, bagging, um, and then Bt and spinosad are effective. Neem is also somewhat effective for oriental fruit moth. Apple maggot is another one that is not super common here, uh, but you will see it sometimes in apples. They overwinter in the soil. Um, they emerge in late May or August and they burrow into the fruit. They look just like a giant fly like this, but they you know, lay eggs that turn into little maggots, little worms in your apples. Um, so sanitation, light tilling, chickens, wild birds. Um, you can also do sticky traps. Um, so they sell round ones like this. We also sell flat ones that are easier to reuse, um, using those and then putting a really sticky substance on them and hanging them up in your apple trees before your apples turn red. Um, that attracts the females to that trap, and then they get stuck and they die. And so then they're not around to attack your apples when your apples turn red. Borers. Um, so there are several species of borer. Peaches are the ones that have the biggest problems. Every peach I've ever seen in St. Louis has been hit by borers at least once. 
Um, but apples can also be a problem. Other stone fruit can be a problem. Potentially pawpaws can have borers. And these are just insects that bore into the wood. So like on peaches, this is what you'll see in an extreme case kind of around the base. Uh, for control, some of the most effective is just putting window screen around the trunk because then they can't get to the trunk. Um, so just like some old window screen around it. We've also found that chives and garlic chives planted really close to the trunk in like a circle around um, can be helpful in confusing those insects. Um, and so you get fewer attacks. And then neem spray between June and September. That's a lot of work, but that can also be um, effective if you're spraying neem onto the trunk. Um, plum curculio is another pest. Uh, plum is their favorite, but they will eat just about anything else. They are native, they overwinter in the ground, and they lay their eggs in fruit. If you see damage like this on your fruit, that is a plum curculio. So uh, for control, this is this is one that is pretty hard, and this is the one. This is the reason why we don't um, why we don't plant plums actually. But some things that you can do to control them, sanitation does help. Um, bagging the fruit is pretty effective because then they can't get to the fruit to damage it. Kaolin clay is useful, which is a spray that, um, well, it's actually, it's a natural clay product that um, you can spray on the fruit and it basically agitates the plum curculio. And so you get fewer attacks, but you have to reapply it basically every time it rains and you have to be on there all year. It's kind of a pain. Spinosad can also work, which is organic, but spinosad is a broad spectrum insecticide. So it will also kill beneficial insects. Um, and then there are some parasitic nematodes that you can buy as a powder online that is supposed to be helpful. I have not used that myself though. And we've got just a few more here. Um, another pest. Uh, this is one that is not necessarily a huge problem, but uh, I've seen more frequently, and that's called pear scylla. So this is a small sucking insect. It causes leaves to turn black, usually in stripes, um, on pears. Um, and, it, and the main reason that I like to bring it up is that it can sometimes look like fire blight. Um, the best control for that is a dormant oil spray um, in the winter. <clears throat> so... Uh, the, the way that you can tell it's not fire blight is that it's not gonna progress. Um, it's just gonna damage the leaves. And again, a lot of times, once you see the damage on the leaf, it's too late. Like the insect has already kind of done its damage. And so really what you're looking at for control is to use a dormant oil that winter to prevent you from having a problem on that tree again the next year. Spotted wing drosophila. This is mostly one that I bring up just so that you're aware of it. This is a really problematic, um, insect and in that it's very difficult to um, to get rid of. It's actually a fruit fly, so it has something like 14 generations a year, something ridiculous. Um, and it likes soft-bodied fruit, particularly blackberries and raspberries. Uh, the later ripening they are, the more problems that fruit will have. Um, and the reason why this is such a big problem is that unlike other fruit flies, it lays its eggs in ripening fruit instead of rotting fruit. And so it can lay its eggs in it and then you pick it and then you, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not gonna eat all these blackberries today. I'll stick them in the fridge. And then you come back a couple of days later and your blackberries are full of maggots, uh, which is not real appealing. So generally the best way to deal with it, and it sounds kind of gross, is just to eat them as you pick them. Cause then there's still eggs. You're not gonna notice it. It's just a little protein. There's no diseases or anything that you're gonna get from it. It's psychologically a little gross, um, but picking those, um, as long as the fruit doesn't look rotten. You know, if the fruit is looking gross, like it's getting all these sunken spots, probably don't eat that. It's going to taste nasty. But if the fruit looks okay, eat it right away or freeze it right away. That's also going to kill any eggs that might be in there. But if you're really wanting to control them, exclusion is kind of the only way. And that would be putting like an insect net around the whole plant. Um, you can use spinosad. Um, but again, that's a broad spectrum insecticide. So it will kill anything it comes into contact with. And because of how fast the spotted wing drosophila's generations are, you have to spray it every single week from bloom to harvest if you're wanting to like really um, control them. Uh, Japanese beetles is one that I'm mostly gonna bring up just to bring up the fact that despite what you've heard, traps do work as long as you do the traps correctly. We have a whole, we have a big blog post about that. I use them in my orchard. 
Um, it saves my hazelnuts and sweet cherries and grapes. Um, I have tried, I tried to control them without the traps um, and I lost several years of crops because there was so much damage from them that they wouldn't produce. Um, I now use the traps every year um, and I get full crops from all of those things. Um, as long as you use them appropriately. And again, we have a blog post up about how to use them appropriately. Um, you can also deter feeding by using a neem spray. Uh, this is not gonna get rid of an active problem, but if you like know, oh, I've had problems with Japanese beetles before on this plant. Um, you know, they usually come out like late June. So like maybe starting in mid June, you start spraying neem on your plant and then it's less likely that they will start feeding on that. And lastly, larger pests. So these are some of the hardest ones to control if you're having a problem. Um, so thing with birds, one of the best ways is to have birds of prey around. If you've got a lot of hawks around, the songbirds aren't usually gonna be hanging out as much. Um, so that is really effective. Netting can be effective, although netting is really annoying, um, but it does you know, keep the insects out. Humming line is my favorite thing to use, which is just this thin ribbon material that looks kind of like uh, the ribbon from cassette tapes um, that when you have it taut next to your, your fruit, when the wind blows on it, it makes this noise that birds really hate. <clears throat> and that's, that's my favorite. For small mammals, trunk guards are important. So having something wrapped around the trunk so that they can't gnaw on the bark is really helpful. And then for animals that wanna climb up into your trees and eat your fruit, um, pruning the branches up higher so that it's harder, like so that they can't jump to the lower branch from the ground. And then having a slick trunk wrap so that they can't climb up the trunk is kind of the most effective way. And then for deer, fencing is really the only way to do. You can either fence the entire area or have like short little fences um, around each tree can also be effective. And that is uh, holistic management for your orchard. <laughs>